Welcome back, everyone, and thank you to the Mushroom Council for sponsoring this break. I hope that some of you got a chance to try out their blended slider recipe, which I think was a delicious example of both boosting umami in a dish, as well as showing how our food choices can impact planetary health. I believe their recipe was a 50-50 blend, but the World Resources Institute analyzed that if just 30% of beef, hamburg beef in hamburgers throughout American Food Service was replaced with mushrooms, that replacement would actually translate into 10.5 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions eliminated and 83 billion gallons of irrigation water saved. We've actually compiled that along with several other compelling figures showing the accelerating impact of plant forward demand in our newly released plant forward by the numbers document, which is available for download on our website. Think of this as your cheat sheet filled with stats, data and insights pulled from multiple sources for making the case that plant forward is not just a passing trend, but actually a longstanding transformation in how Americans eat and make food choices. Speaking of numbers, before we jump into the next session, let's take a quick look at the poll results. I need to navigate over there. So for people, um, are you looking at bringing new ingredients or products into your operation? And if so, when? Um, it looks like most people are saying right away, innovation is key, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, these current conditions have sort of made us all need to rethink our models and what we're doing with our menus, um, both from an efficiency standpoint, delivering what consumers want, um, as well as just confronting a new future, really. So thanks so much for participating in the poll. It looks like um, we've still got a ways in terms of full participation. So if you didn't get a chance to fill out the poll yet, please go over there and check it out. So in 2019, the CIA partnered with QSR Magazine to launch the CIA QSR Plant Forward Fast Casual Watch List, a curated catalog of fast casual restaurants using their scale and culinary innovation to make Plant Forward the new normal for the masses. This year, we partnered with FSR, QSR sister magazine to shine a similar light on those restaurants that are delivering the indulgence, deliciousness, and quality options that diners expect from full service concepts, all in plant forward form. The full list has a really beautiful layout in FSR's May issue, and you can find it both on fsrmagazine.com as well as on our Plant Forward Kitchen website. Joining us today is Nicole Duncan, who is editor of FSR Magazine, and she is going to be leading the next panel discussion with a few honorees from the list. Hey, Nicole. Hey, Jackie. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Happy to good. be here. Yes, so glad to have you here. Um, I want to remind our audience that we have reserved some time at the end of the panel for audience questions. So again, as always, you've probably heard us say it multiple times so far, um, but please submit those at any time through the chat function on the right hand side of your screen. I'm going to be popping back up um, to bring some of those questions to the panel discussion a little bit later. But in the meantime, I'll let you take it away, Nicole. Thanks, Jackie. And thank you everyone for joining us for this session. Um, it was really exciting to be able to do this. Um, our parent company, Food News Media, um, we were really excited to partner last year for QSR and now to be able to look at things 
from the full service restaurant side of things. There's a lot of similarities, but also some differences. Um, these delicious dishes you see circling through right now um, are from the restaurants that our three panelists are with. Um, so our panelists today, we have Becky Mulligan. She is the CEO of The Little Beat and The Little Beat Table. The first one is a fast casual and the second one is a more traditional sit down full service. We also have Isa Chandra Moskowitz. Uh, she is the chef and owner of Modern Love, which has locations in Brooklyn and in Omaha, Nebraska. And lastly, we have uh, Joshua McFadden. He is the co-owner and chef of Submarine Hospitality in Portland, Oregon, and it, its um, concepts include Ava Jeans and Tusk. So thank you all for being here. Okay. Thanks for having us, Nicole. This is great. So all three of you are in our uh, plant forward watch list for FSR, and um, your concepts are different. Like um, Isa, yours is completely plant-based, whereas Little Beat, Ava Jeans and Tusk, it's more plant forward. Um, and I would like to ask you all, when you were building these concepts or when you were kind of thinking about bringing them forward, why was it so important to make sure that plants, whether it's vegetables, fruits, whole grains, pulses, lentils, why were they such an integral part for your concept? We'll just jump in. I'll jump in. Yeah, jump in. Um, for Little Beat Table and, and for Little Beat, both of our concepts, we look through the lens of wellness and healthy eating and supporting um specific dietary requirements for everything we do. And so when you start thinking about that, um, celebrating plants and just the natural goodness and wellness and nutrition that come from them uh, really pushes all of that forward in our menu. And then um, also through the lens of sustainability and to the statistic that Jackie just shared at the beginning, uh, the more that we can um, share uh, the you know beauty of a plant-based lifestyle, the more that we're going to help save the earth too. So all around, we love being plant forward and the excitement that it creates in our concepts. Isa, how about you? Since yours is kind of a different side, it's completely plant-based. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've been vegan for 30 years, so there was really no other way I was going to go. Mm -hmm. I opened a vegan restaurant. Mm -hmm. But your menu is, it does go beyond kind of the comfort foods, um, that are, you know, obviously soy-based products are plant-based, but you also do celebrate mm -hmm. very much vegetables, um, different fruits. I know those Pop-Tarts are filled with yeah. um, seasonal fare. I don't know if folks saw that circulating, but every time I see that photo, I- Yeah, I so really we work with local farms and we keep things seasonal. We use a lot of vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, we do everything from scratch. So our cheeses, our meats are all um, done in-house from scratch. We think that's really important to create like a, a vegan food culture also, not just like, hey, I have got a whatever brand burger. Like to me, that's not, I mean, it's cool. Like if I'm traveling across country, cool. I can get a vegan burger someplace. But like for us, it's important that like vegan cuisine is taken seriously. So we definitely do as much from scratch, local sourced as we can while still being uh, comfort food. For sure. And Joshua, um, some of the cuisine, I think especially Ava Jeans is very, it's a variety, but you have Italian, which is kind of, it, vegetables are certainly celebrated in Italian, Italian, but a lot of times the way we think of it in the States is very kind of just carb forward, a lot of meats, but you all really incorporate that fresh mentality into the menu. Yeah, we do. And I think to answer the first question you had, I think, I think simply put, I think vegetables are just fun. I think that they're delicious and I think that we live seasonally um, there's no way around that. So there's never been a way around me not thinking seasonally from the 20 years I've been doing this. And it just really has always been about um, not only our vegetables fun, but so is, so are farmers. I mean, I couldn't do the things that I do without the farmers and the relationships that I have to be able to just kind of simply take a great product and then just make it a little bit better, hopefully is the goal. Um, so it was kind of an accident with David jeans that we became, um, plant forward, I guess it's called now, but eight years ago, it was just, it was very simple for me to be able to look at the Giardini section, which is our vegetable section of the menu that we put on the menu to just be almost more Italian in that approach. Cause it's just all the seasonal things and all these different variations um, in combination with leaf salads, grain salads, and just vegetable focused salads. And it was just hyper seasonal. So it, it was against the idea of how you would put together a normal restaurant menu where it just be like you would have an asparagus dish. Well, we would have like six different asparagus dishes. And 
that just because I'm kind of has always been our focus and the things kind of led us to actually starting our own farm. So. That's great. And has it changed for, for you being, you know, eight years seeing the evolution and granted you were in a market like Portland where maybe this trend kind of started sooner. Same with Becky being in New York and Issa in New York and Omaha. Have you all watched this evolution with maybe your guests initially being a bit hesitant about trying six different kinds of asparagus dishes or trying uh, vegan chicken fingers or something like this, or you know, embracing something where vegetables are center of plate. Has that changed in the last decade? Have you all seen that kind of shift? Um, I haven't. I, I mean, I, I live in Portland, but I you know, also cooked in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, farmed in Maine, lived in Italy, and this is just what I've been doing for 20 years. So mm -hmm. I, I think the easiest way to answer that is probably when I was working at Franny's in Brooklyn um, in like 2003, four. That to me was kind of radical because it was so seasonally focused and it was, I'd already come from like San Francisco, which is just like, that's the only option as we've all heard the jokes. But um, that was a restaurant that was just fiercely committed to seasonality. And, and then I started working at other restaurants and I realized that there's a lot of people that claim that, but don't necessarily commit to that. So it's always the, um, you know, all of a sudden it's spring. So everyone's expecting it to be spring. So when they go into a restaurant, they're supposed to be asparagus and snap peas and all these things. And all of a sudden they just show up, but they're not available locally. So it's like, they're coming from eight or 10 hours or 12 hours or from Florida or wherever. And that was kind of always an interesting moment because it was just like, I never wanted to jump the opportunity of having what is the best because that's local so getting something that's a strawberry from florida six weeks earlier and then all of a sudden getting the better strawberries the be the more flavorful strawberries seem like a difficult way to work because you're starting with a, an, a product that's not as good to get the good product so it was always like you need to start with the good product to work its way out to kind of understand it so i think that was always very interesting for me so i don't think it's been difficult to explain to guests because it's always been the only way to do it and it's been a very exciting approach to be able to just be like here's the best here's the freshest here's the thing that we all want right now i probably have the opposite experience of people that don't have a fully vegan restaurant and that it's difficult to get people to eat vegetables in a vegan restaurant <laughs> because that, those are the options at non-vegan restaurants so they're super excited to come and have like say 10 buffalo wings meanwhile i've spent my poured my heart into an asparagus dish and three people order it, but 20 people order the wings, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting little um, that problem is interesting. to have, making vegans eat their vegetables or people, I think people coming to a vegan restaurant are really excited about tofu and um, just trying vegan versions of their favorite things. And maybe they've been to um, another restaurant that was as you're calling a plant forward and they've had that. And so they're like, Oh, well, what do vegans do? So I think it's a little bit opposite. And also I used to eat at Franny's all the time because I lived around the corner. And so, you know what I mean? Right. I mean, it just was like, it yeah. was so fiercely focused on that simplicity of like, you know, Franny's was open right now. We could walk in. I'm sure we'd probably be looking at like a raw asparagus salad with just lemon and pecorino, black pepper and breadcrumbs. And then we would do yeah, that. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we would do that until you can't eat raw asparagus. So that was my point was like, well, yeah, you can cheat and get in the stuff that you really can't serve raw because it's even out of season there and then get something in. So you, you kind of lose the opportunity to learn how to make something delicious, which I think is even harder to be able to, you know, instill to the guests that like, oh, this is really good. You're supposed to be eating it raw. Well, it's not good if it's not great raw. And then you have right. to work that way and then work it out. And then you start cooking it or changing it and adapting to it. And then it just finds its way off the menu until next year. Yeah. I think it's also interesting um, to think about how you mentioned at the beginning, different geographies kind of react to uh, being vegan or vegetarian or vegetable forward in different ways. And we have the benefit of having um, Little Bee Table in multiple cities. And the way that my guests interact with vegetables in New York is very different than they do in uh, Chevy Chase, Maryland. And so we're trying to think about what's important locally and what's relevant and what's approachable because if we think about what's approachable, it is really different for my um, guests on Park Avenue in New York than it is in Chevy Chase, Maryland. And so that's been a really interesting thing for 
us to think about. My chefs are constantly, you know, coming up with these beautiful dishes. And we finally get to the point where we're like, oh, yeah, that's going to work on Park Avenue. But how are we going to make it more approachable in different places? Because we're really trying to get people interested in, you know, looking at what are the different ways to eat vegan or vegetarian that they maybe just haven't had exposure to. Mm -hmm. And do you find so especially Becky, you might be able to weigh on, in on this since the Little Beat Tables full service, but its sister concept mm -hmm. is fast casual. Do you all feel that there is something, there's an inherent advantage to really kind of pushing vegetables in a full service setting um, just because the guest is expecting maybe a bit more flourish, I would say, maybe culinary <laughs> flourish than when you're going to say a sweet green or a little beet, um, you're expecting high quality for sure, but maybe not as much innovation. And I was just wondering, how does that vary between your two concepts? Uh, I think it's a great question. Um, it, it's interesting for us because we're also gluten-free across both. Uh, we are starting to offer a couple of um, gluten full bread options at table, but we won't at little beet. And so that puts a little bit of a, a different spin on it as well. Um, because to that question and using, you know, kind of gluten and vegetables as an example, we find that in the full serve experience, um, even though they're eating a nutritious and flavorful meal, my customers actually want beer. And because we haven't had regular mm -hmm. beer, pairing that with a beautiful vegetable dish or having, um, you know, a way for them to complement what they're having has made it a more approachable experience. And that doesn't come into the, the fast casual concept. So, um, We've explored a lot of different ways to think about that, but um, it, it's kind of funny. One of my chefs is always sneaking vegetables in in a way that's unexpected to things, you know, where uh, somebody might expect to eat guacamole, but when you start adding different things to it, which are getting more nutrients or more vegetables into it, then somebody realizes, oh, I didn't know I liked watercress. And then I had it in that. Um, and now I know I might like it and I might be interested in something else. So we explore more there in the fast casual uh, we've had a little bit of fun with trying to find alternative proteins. So uh, we did put a barbecue jackfruit on the menu last year in the fast casual. And we found that fewer people knew what that was or what to expect. And it was different than what they, you know, thought they could get in a three minute experience in a fast casual. And so we got a lot of feedback on it, but then it started to sell and started to catch on. So then we actually did a jackfruit taco in the full serve um, as well. So uh, it goes back and forth a little bit between both, but uh, I think the creativity and the rate of change in the full serve is, is uh, more acceptable because we're also working with seasonal items more where we're always looking for a seasonal item, seasonal item in the full serve, but in the fast casual, we will buy produce um, to keep some of the standard menu items on year round. And um Kind of one thing that I know we all talked about beforehand when we were chatting earlier this week was how plant forward, especially in the full service space, looks moving forward given the crisis we're in with the pandemic right now. There are dining ba dine in bands that are leading many uh, full serves to kind of rethink if they should be doing del delivery and takeout. At the same time, I think, Isa, you pointed out people want comfort food right now. And comfort food hasn't traditionally been equated with a plant forward dish. Um, certainly, you know, chefs like you two and brands like the Little Beat Table are pushing that and kind of challenging that idea. But how does your business look and how does the, the plant forward kind of mentality look in light of what's happening now and what the restaurant landscape might look like a year or two from now? For me, we just completely became a fast casual restaurant in Omaha. Brooklyn closed and is reopening, but we'll probably follow the same model. So we were luckily already doing, we called it swanky vegan comfort food. So cool. But um, just a lot of our elements, our plating elements kind of get lost in, um, you know, doing takeout only. So that's a big, big loss. But on the other hand, we just kind of pared down the menu and stuck with the stuff people really loved. So our, and we could still source a lot of the ingredients locally. So um, our burgers and mac and cheese and uh, like our cauliflower, our barbecue cauliflower, we can source. Um, we use a lot of radishes and a lot of different like 
we were using a lot of microgreens and edible flowers and things like that. So now we've kind of moved more towards like color pops from vegetables we could source. So like cabbage and pickled red onions and things like that. So, um, but, but yeah, we've, we're pretty much a fast casual restaurant at this point because you can't really plate use beet powder on a to go item. So how about you up in the Northwest, Joshua? Has it changed or how is it looking? Um, well, we've always, as I've already demonstrated, been fiercely, you know, seasonal and local. Mm -hmm. um, as I also mentioned, we started our own farm, but we just started it this year. So I wish that it would have been started last year <laughs> yeah. um, to have a little bit more of our own security. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, again, kind of proves that the conversation that we're talking about as plant forward is just seasonal and local. You know, I think the local is the biggest thing and it makes the most sense is it's just better. The asparagus, as I said, is better when it's sweeter, when it's local. And I think that that's always been the obvious thing to me. I couldn't imagine um, writing a menu that wasn't seasonal. I don't, I wouldn't know how to do it. I mean, I can only imagine it's a lot easier. <laughs> but it's, it doesn't seem like it would be as rewarding. And I don't think that I would be able to get the commitment from my staff or the guests when they were able to come into the dining room to feel that same level of commitment. So um, it's shifted and I think it's just been compounding the idea that we're always been doing what we should be doing and just need to figure out how to, you know, secure that up even more going forward um, with our own farm. And, you know, it's almost, it's kind of like you have this whole, they're, they're at, op, they're opposing each other, this whole idea that people do want comfort foods at this time. But at the same time, anecdotally, I've been seeing a number of people going to farmer's markets more than before. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of restaurants are trying to bring their supply chains a little bit closer to home just for mm -hmm. sheer logistics right now. So I guess you might worry that the plant forward movement or maybe seasonal could be put on hold because of this, but at the same time, maybe it would be pushing this movement farther along where people have this new appreciation given what's happening. I would definitely agree with that. I think that, um, you know, I live in Portland, so it's, it's definitely obviously different, but I know from all the farmers that I work with, like their CSAs are up in very large numbers and, that is because of that security that I was just talking about, being able to get safe seasonal food. So um, I would like to think that even the fact that we're just talking about plant four, that everything's already shifted and changed. I mean, I've seen it change so much in 20 years. And I wrote a book based on the idea of six seasons and seasonality, because when I started cooking in, in New York, I went to this really great bookstore and asked for something about seasons. And I was handed the um, New, Jer New Jersey Farmer's Almanac. They have one which for New like, Jersey specifically. Which was like, <laughs> well, they have them everywhere, but yeah. it was like that was the closest place that they're getting all, all their vegetables from and that beautiful black dirt and all these things. But it was just like in 2004, that was the thing that was handed to me to be able for me to start learning about what was available when. And also obviously going to the farmer's market, but just like starting to get an understanding of how to predict and what it means to create menus in those time periods and hunger gaps and all that type of stuff. So I think it's already progressing in a really positive way. And I also think people are just eating less meat, which I think is great and no meat, which is even better. So I think it's positive and moving in the right direction. That's great. That's great. Becky, you're back. Apologies. I think I'm <laughs> glad to be back on a hotspot because it appears that our entire little town has lost internet. <laughs> so oh, no. try to work. Out. Sorry. No Good timing. Yeah, we're glad to have you back, Becky, and pardon the interruption from me, but wanted to make sure that we have some time for audience questions, which we've been getting in the chat. Um, so one of the questions that we had was um, coming from James. He asked, do you find that people navigate more to animal protein comparisons with plants? Or do you see people coming for simply plant forward meals? I think that's a really interesting question. You say you were kind of talking about that in terms of, you know, people wanting to see the sort of vegan versions of things that they normally eat versus um, Joshua, what you were kind of talking about, about, you know, when you just start with something seasonal, it's kind of plant forward 
by nature. How do, how do you each see that play out in terms of what your customers are asking for? For me, again, pe well, people are basically coming there for these vegan versions. They're not necessarily coming there for plant forward. So they're coming there mm -hmm. to have a vegan mac and cheese or um, a vegan cheesecake. Um, they, and they might be seasonal, but that's mm -hmm. not why they're- Do you like have there. a sense, Isa, of, um, of your customer base in terms of percentage that identify as vegan or vegetarian versus vegetarian? Yeah. Um, well, in Omaha and Brooklyn, it's really different. <laughs> probably opposite. I'd say 10% of our customers in Omaha are vegan or vegetarian mm -hmm. and 90% not. Um, and I'd say in Brooklyn, it's probably <laughs> mm -hmm. reverse or at least close to it. It's probably close to like, maybe it's like 70% vegan in Brooklyn, 30% not. And these are just guesses from talking to people, but Omaha just doesn't have a huge vegan community mm -hmm. and that's where we started. Um, so, but it's pretty cool. Like that's why I, kind of, um, I spent a lot of time at the Omaha one because it's like so needed here. There's so many rest, uh, vegan mm -hmm. restaurants in Brooklyn already. Well, mm -hmm. less now, so, but um, hopefully get back to Brooklyn soon and get that restarted. But yeah, when we started in Brooklyn, we were the, in a, Omaha, we were the only vegan mm -hmm. restaurant. So it was really nice having people come in mm -hmm. like wanting to try vegan food specifically. Um, and now there's, I think three mm -hmm. vegan businesses here um, since we started and a couple more in Lincoln, which isn't too far. So it's been really nice to see it expand um, and just have people mm -hmm. interested in. That's great. It. There's um, another question and um, I'd like to pose this to Becky and Joshua and maybe tie into this previous question a little bit also in terms of what plant-based ingredients have the highest perceived value from customers. Um, and if you don't mind me putting a personal spin on it, I'm also intrigued by for you, whether your customers um, question the amount of animal protein that you're putting in a dish, whether they want to see more and they express that or if they, you know, feel really satisfied and, um, and sort of accept the dish as it is, as opposed to comparing it to what they might see in terms of animal protein based dishes. I'm thinking, yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a, a great uh, series of questions there. We don't offer a lot of alternatives. As, as I said, we tried a uh, jackfruit, a uh, barbecue jackfruit fruit that is sort of a replacement for like a barbecue pulled pork. Um, for a lot of our uh, customers that don't eat meat but wanted something that's in that realm. Um, because we're grounded in wellness and healthy eating and really being able to accommodate any dietary restrictions, we don't have a lot of things that have multiple ingredients in them. And so I think that puts us in a place where uh, I don't think we're really dealing with that. And so it's more about the entire menu because we do serve some animal proteins. And we find that's necessary because we might have a family where somebody really wants the, um, you know, the vegan option or the vegetarian options that we have, but there might be one person in the group that wants a burger. And so we try to find a really, you know, sustainably sourced um, animal protein option for them. Um, so I think it just might be a little bit different because we don't have um, really other than tofu would be the only thing on the menu that I would say is consistently uh, something that would be kind of that protein mm -hmm. option mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. in animal protein. Josh, Otherwise, it's think, all kind of vegetables. I think for me and Ava Jeans, it's a, it's different because uh, an Italian restaurant is already should be focused on the idea of you know sharing the table, so you're working through courses of things. Um, we're not vegetarian, and we don't do um, you know sub substitutions for trying to make something that isn't. It's just a vegetable focused restaurant, which um, we sell more vegetables than we do anything else um, and then in that typical italian setting you're provided a very small portion of protein uh, usually with vegetables and then you can add on a, a starch or another vegetable but your starch is typically kind of pasta so you're i think it's a little bit different because we've always been able to compartmentalize things and people can kind of have their own way with the menu so it's a little bit different and as i said the vegetable focus or the vegetable section of the menu has always been the thing that leads and the thing that people are most intrigued about and the thing that is probably the most special. And it was all an accident. Mm -hmm. That's really, I, 
I find that's really interesting also, um, going back to you, Issa, in terms of thinking, you know, you've got um, people come to your restaurant looking for vegan versions of things, and it's a different mix of consumers um, or, or customers coming in who identify vegan vegetarian. Um, do you find that particular dishes are sort of seen as higher value? Um, for your customers? You know, is it the vegan version of an animal, of a what is traditionally an animal-based dish that is higher, or is it something that is sort of inherently plant-forward that is perceived as having higher value? I think things that are inherently are have higher value, just some of the mushrooms we do, some of the local foods. So, um, yeah, we kind of price it that way more than, oh, everybody you know if it's if it's fried chicken but it's tofu fried chicken it's going to be cheaper than if it's mm -hmm. fried hen of the woods mm -hmm. mushroom fried chicken so it's more about the priciness of the vegetables which i mean a lot of people think oh vegetables are so cheap why is it so expensive it's like you don't <laughs> know what a hen of the woods mushroom is <laughs> and also how much work it takes to transform some of the ingredients into what we do and doing everything from scratch um, and not that we're, it's not especially expensive, but we do get people really not understanding how a mushroom could be expensive. So I don't know what people's perception always is, but I I feel like people do um, pay more for the more local things and for, the, <laughs> and for mushrooms. That's interesting. Nicole, I want to go to you also. You guys cover the industry as a whole. How are you, and, and obviously, you know, you um, did the research in terms of putting together the watch list and seeing these leading players. Like, how is this playing out across the whole industry? What's really interesting, and I should preface it first, that I used to work on both QSR before I became exclusive FSR. So it's been interesting sides of the service model um, because it it's, used to be, I think, very much... Um, can, can you guys see me? Everything froze. Yes, I can still see and hear you. Can you guys oh, see me? Nicole, Nicole maybe can't hear us anymore, <laughs> but we can hear her. Oh, I think we've lost her. We're going to try to get her back quickly. Um, I wonder, okay, while we're waiting for Nicole, we <laughs> unfortunately we need to wrap up the panel. But, oh, no, maybe we have Nicole back. You know, it couldn't have happened while I wasn't talking. Right. <laughs> okay. I don't know where I cut off. I was just going to say it's been really interesting seeing this movement from both the limited service side and the full service side, because I think full service really celebrating plants used to be kind of relegated more to fine dining only. Like you would go to a very, very fancy restaurant to see this amazing things they could do with vegetables or this very creative like um, lentil dish or things like that. It's been really fun to see the democratization of it where you can go somewhere without breaking the bank. I mean, it might be a, you know, a $30 per person meal, but it's, it's really become something that is being shared beyond just a very specific niche. So I, I would say that's one thing we find really interesting on both sides of the service model. That's really great. I am afraid we are out of time for the panel, but Nicole, um, as the moderator for the panel, I don't know if you have final final thoughts or anything that you want to say in summary. Well, I just want to thank all three of our panelists for making the time. I know it's really crazy going on right now, so thank you. Um, thank the CIA for collaborating with us. If you have not gotten your May issue of FSR Magazine, um, <laughs> that's the wrong page. Please check out our feature. We've got information on all three of um, the restaurants that our panelists represent and um, just that's about it. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nicole. Thanks, Becky, thank yeah. Joshua, and Issa. Um, we got through some of those internet um, yeah. issues. I know we're probably breaking the system given our load with our big audience for our webcast. Um, so we're going to take a final look at the poll results. Um, but first, before we do that, here's a quick recap of our next and final event, the networking reception. Very similar to the break earlier, we've got a range of ways for you to engage with everyone else who is attending today, from your peers and suppliers to the other presenters.
presenters as well. Um, the slides that you're seeing right now will show you where to find everything. Uh, the activities include themed discussion tables, one-on-one -on -one networking, and our sponsor expo, of course. Um, one thing I'll mention also, I know I've been talking to a lot of operators in the past few weeks, and um, I think there's a lot of discussion around how um, their vendors and suppliers can be supporting them through this. And I think that um, going to the sponsor booths is a great way to be talking to some of these suppliers and your vendors and kind of talking about new solutions going forward. So I hope you'll check that out. Um, I also want to remind you that you're entered in a raffle each week when you participate. And if you attend and participate all five weeks, you've got the chance to win registration and travel to next uh, to next year's conference in Napa. Um, and last, we want to make sure that you get a chance to offer your opinion on the second day of our virtual series. So please fill out the survey, which you can access um, through the link that you'll get via email. Uh, we hope you'll join us next Wednesday when we dive deeper into the mind of the consumer and offer more strategies for plant forward menus and kitchens, including sandwich innovation and how to take care of your teams. You'll find the full schedule at plantforwardkitchen.org. Okay, and now final look at the polls. Um, it looks like everybody is still looking to do innovation right away, which I love. People are looking to bring new ingredients and products into their operations. So bravo to all of you for taking on um, innovation during what can be a really difficult time. Thanks so much for participating, everybody. And we'll see you here same time, same place next week.